to Elizabeth for that beautiful prelude. Um, that is the song Sovereign by Chris Tomlin and it just has wonderful lyrics um, that God is sovereign um, in, the, in the calm, he's sovereign in the storm and all the pieces of our, with all the pieces of our life from beginning to the end, we can trust him. So as we come together to worship today, just remember that God's love is better than life and that is why our lips glorify him. So I pray that um, you will quiet your hearts, remove any distractions, and uh, just uh, let's give our, all our glory to God at this time. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for being on the throne when everything around us seems tumultuous and crazy. Um, we rejoice in our salvation. I pray that you would restore to us that joy that as we come before you to sing, we would just be happy and thankful um, despite our circumstances um, that you pulled us out of the miry clay and you set our feet upon the rock. Um, may we just rejoice. May we be together um, at this time. In Jesus name we pray, amen. Hello and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. The songs we're going to sing today 
have a theme of looking to Jesus. And these songs were actually written over a hundred years apart. Be Thou My Vision, a classic hymn, was written in 1912, based off of actually a 6th century Irish poem. And we're also singing Behold Our God, a contemporary song from 2011. And despite this century worth of difference from when they were composed, there's still timeless truths in both of them that remind us to look to the Lord. And I think it's because Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says it so well. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so this passage reminds us that no matter the distractions in our life, no matter the things that prevent us from running this Christian race and this life uh, so fully, we're supposed to look upward towards heaven, towards the object of our faith, and he'll help us in this race and to help us through life. And so let's consider this as we open this time in prayer and worship together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us someone to focus on, that when all the distractions of the world might weigh us down and cause us to go off course, you're there to remind us to, to look upward and live for things that are heavenly, things that won't, rot, won't rust or, or dis be destroyed. And so we ask that we'd place our faith in Christ, that our eyes would be set on him, that we'd be living a life that is focused on serving you and you alone. Thank you so much for Christ. We look to you now during this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, Fellowship Bible Church. It's good to be back with you after some time of vacation in ministry, and uh, and it's been uh, very enthusiastically refreshing, and uh, and I've been uh, excited for this portion of the scripture. Uh, today, we are going to be taking a look at preparing a place for worship. And in fact, isn't that what we've been doing for the past five years? We've been meeting with architects to get specific um, building uh, instructions. And then for the last year or so, we've been uh, watching our contractors uh, put together a building. And I'm pretty excited. We are hoping that uh, the building will be done and uh, by the end of this month. We are praying that we can get gas and electricity uh, set up. But, you know, this is where we will go to meet God together. This is going to be exciting. We're worshiping from home, but this is where we will be gathered together to worship him. And I am so excited for that. That's where we're going to meet God and meet people. That's our priority with this building for the next few generations. Here's a little picture of inside the new foyer. You can see it's uh, it's bigger now. It's cut into what used to be uh, uh, cut into the old fellowship hall. You can see how it got pushed out further too. It's going to be classy and bright and warm and friendly. Uh, and uh, and this is where we're going to greet new people who don't know the Lord Jesus and and uh, and introduce them to Christ and our church all at the same time. Meeting God, meeting people. This is uh, an, an important part as we kind of go on this journey <clears throat> for the nation of Israel. It's been a journey as well. Uh, they have left the nation of Egypt. They uh, are now going to a place that is overwhelmed with pagan nations and it is vitally important for there to be a place for worship. And God is very specific about what we call the tabernacle, because this is God coming to be with us. The tabernacle is a mobile place of worship. We've had to be mobile, and thanks to Zoom and, and, uh, and other alternatives, <clears throat> Excuse me, we haven't been able to meet in our building, but we still find alternatives to worship. One day there will be a permanent place for Israel to worship, and that would be the temple. But for 500 years, from Moses to Solomon, the tabernacle would be their mobile place of worship until Solomon established a temple that actually lasted until 70 AD, so it's not that permanent. There will be a new one established when Christ comes to reign again, and we're looking forward to that new temple. But preparing a place for worship is purposeful. 40% of the book of Exodus has to do with the tabernacle, and we're going to all do this in one message. But 40% of the book has to do with it. And why? because God wants to dwell with us. That's the cool point about the whole tabernacle. He could just say, all right, just do your thing. I'm going to check out and not pay attention. No, he wants to have a visible, tangible presence within the heart of Israel. Now, we know God is all over the place. We call that omnipresence, right? But, but he has chosen this tabernacle for a symbolic presence for him to meet this nation of two and a half to three million people. So the first thing we see is for the purpose for a place of worship. It's the fellowship with God. God wants to be with us. He says, and let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell in their mists. We don't have an absentee Heavenly Father. We don't have a careless creator. 
We have a heavenly father and a creator who wants to be with us. Why did he save us? So that he, he would be with us. When we sinned, we turned our back on God. Jesus chased, Jesus chased us down with his grace and mercy and taking the initiative to die on the cross so that we can have an eternal fellowship with God. Meeting God is the number one priority of our salvation, of the tabernacle, and, uh, and that's, why, uh, that, that's why there's this tabernacle. God wants to be with his people that he might dwell in their midst. Exodus 29 later says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting, that's the tabernacle, it, it, it's, it, it's just another word for tent, and the altar. Aaron, who's Moses' brother, also and his sons, I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. Not those pagan gods they're walking through, not Dagon and not Molech and not uh, uh, Baal, but Yahweh, the one true God. So the number one reason for the tabernacle is to fellowship with God. The second reason, oh, well, and here is just kind of a layout of this. Uh, we, we will see that there is a, a courtyard. Outside of the courtyard, there's an altar where sacrifices are made. But there is a tented area that is called the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies, there's another area behind a veil, um, which is the most holy places, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is. So if you want to know where the Ark of the Covenant is, don't ask Indiana Jones. It's behind that veil. Well, it was behind that veil. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so it was there that the presence of God was. He gave the instructions. It would be uh, 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. There'd be, uh, there'd be a linen fence seven and a half feet high, with very solid acacia wood covered with bronze. The entrance, there was only one entrance. There was only one gate into here, which was on the east side. That was 30 foot wide. And so, so he gives very specific instructions to build a place where he is going to meet the nation of Israel. So number one, to fellowship with God. Number two, to fellowship with God's people to fellowship with God's people. This tabernacle is placed in the middle of two and a half to three million people. We get the list of men per tribe who were, and all three tribes, uh, well, three tribes were placed to the north, three to the west, three to the east, three to the south, right? We see that Moses and, uh, and other tribes of Levite uh, they tended to the tabernacle, so they got to live really close to the tabernacle. But here, the tabernacle was central to the life of Israel. It was right in the middle. And, uh, uh, and so it was the hub of Israel's life. David Levy put it this way. The tabernacle was the focal point of Israel's community and life with the tribes dwelling around all four sides. So we see 186 from three tribes, 157 from another 151, and 108 from uh, two other sides. That totals to about 603,000, but that's just the men. That doesn't include the women and the children, which would take the numbers up to two and a half to three million people. And so uh, uh, David Levy uh, estimates from another author that it, the the extent around the tabernacle was probably about 12 square miles to accommodate that many people. And so, um, so, so this would be, uh, this would be pretty, uh, a pretty spectacular sight uh, to see. Now, remember, they're on foot. Uh, they, they have not settled down yet, but yet they needed a place for worship as they would have the nomadic 40 years. The, so the third reason for the tabernacle, number one, to meet God, number two, to be with God's people, it was the center of their community, and then third, it's to prefigure the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we get a wonderful summary description of the tabernacle in Hebrews 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in earthly places of earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the present is called the holy place. <clears throat> Behind the second curtain, uh, behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was the golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak in detail. So here in the New Testament, we get a summary statement of the tabernacle. But notice what it says a few verses later. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So here, Jesus is that replacement to the tabernacle. <clears throat> He's a replacement to that tent. Jesus is symbolized in the, in verse 12, it, it continues, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. <clears throat> Excuse me for my allergies here, but my, uh, what, what happened in the Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement, also called Yom Kippur, which is still celebrated today, they just don't have a temple in which an, a sacrifice is given for the whole nation. And it's not even necessary because Jesus is now the new sacrifice for the whole world. But what happened with the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement would go in, cleanse himself, and offer a sacrifice and sprinkle it on uh, the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. He would use bloods of goats and calves, but Jesus didn't enter the holy place with blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. And he secured our eternal redemption. It's secure, you can't lose it. If you have it, he secured it. Jesus is symbolized in the tabernacle through the gate, the sacrificial lamb, the water, the bread of life, the light of the world, the high priests, and uh, being our access to God. And so when we take a look at the tabernacle, we're seeing some amazing preview pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Revelation 21 concludes uh, by saying in the last chapter, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So the three purposes for the tabernacle, number one, to meet God, number two, to meet with God's people, and then number three, to be a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the tabernacle of God who will dwell with us. The participation is now on our side. When God comes to dwell with us, he's testing our hearts. And he's testing our hearts through the area of a love offering. We see in 25, chapter 25, it says, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive a contribution from me. Now, what we see, it's a voluntary offering. It was not required. Later in chapter 30, we see a half shekel tax for everybody that's over 20. <clears throat> but here we see that there is a love offering as the heart moves you. And as the heart moves, we contribute to the tabernacle. They contributed gold. They contributed jewelry. They contributed wood. They contributed um, skins uh, of animals that, you know, that they would use for blankets and clothing and, and coverings. And so, so all these things were given. And I do want to thank our dear church family for the wonderful generosity of 
giving to our uh, church project. Uh, it, it's 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 very much a picture. This is a place where we're going to meet God, where God's people are going to meet together. But it comes through the generous contributions. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to, to give a thank you. It's not paid off yet. You know, and there's some great projects ahead. People wonder why we stored money for so long, you know, it, uh, because we knew we were going to either do this or buy a place. And we needed to have this in order to make this move. Now we don't have any more money in the bank. But, but based on all the contribution, uh, we, we are just certainly grateful for that. And it echoes what was done in the Old Testament. So there's the purpose, there's the participation. Let's get take and take a look at the specific plans. God was very specific about his plans for this place of worship. Why? Well, not only did he want it well built, you know, when we take a look at why the architects had to design this, why the engineers had to make sure it was secure. Did you know that the safest spot to stand in our new church is going to be underneath the entry to the uh, to what used to be the old fireside room? We have kind of the most sturdy steel beam right there. So under an earthquake, everybody rushed there. Okay, right across from the nursery. Nursery is pretty stable, too. So, uh, so, uh, but all these things were made according to purpose for a reason, for stability, for, for but, but also there's, you're going to see a great sense of aesthetics, but a lot of times they're picturing the Lord Jesus Christ in this. And so the plans are very specific. So first thing he talks about here is the Ark of the Covenant. So he talks about the offering, chapter 25, one through nine. Then he gets into the instructions. And so, uh, so Christ, com uh, Christ is the one who completes the Ark of the Covenant. It's made uh, out of acacia wood, and it's overlaid with gold. So it's solid wood, but it's also gold. <clears throat> it's a marvelous representation, even of our Lord Jesus, who's both God and man. God is represented by gold and, and wood is representative of earth and, and, uh, and, and how these two come together just beautifully. The Ark of the Covenant is only seen by two people. That would be Moses, who could approach God at any time, according to verse 22, and the high priest, who in Leviticus 16 would come once a year on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were three items. One is manna or, or bread. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a reminder how God fed and took care of Israel in the wilderness. And so it's a, a reminder of God's provision of their daily bread. And Christ is the bread of life, ultimately pictured in that manna. The second item was the staff that belonged to Aaron that actually budded. They call it an almond staff, and, and it, it, was, it, was, it was budding. It was, uh, this, it was a, a beautiful picture of even uh, the resurrection of Christ. You know, you would look at something that looks kind of inanimate, but it keeps budding. And, um, and, and that was a picture of, of life or even a picture of his resurrection. Then there was the tablets of law, the Ten Commandments. And again, we see Christ in this because Christ didn't come to destroy the law, according to Matthew 5, 17, but to fulfill the law. He, he fulfilled what we couldn't do. The law pointed out how sinful we are and that we couldn't keep God's commandments. But Christ could, and he fulfilled the law on our behalf. So even the items that uh, were contained in the ark are emblematic of the person of Christ. Then we come uh, later in ch chapter 25 to what's called the mercy seat. The mercy seat is on top of the ark of the covenant. It's actually the top of the ark of the covenant. It's not separate. It's all part of the ark of the covenant, but, but it's the top. Uh, and uh, again, this is uh, something that uh, is constructed with gold that has two cherubim angels pictured on the top. And, uh, and here is where the, uh, uh, the blood would be sprinkled in the tabernacle uh, of, uh, of a goat onto this mercy seat. And, uh, and he would sprinkle it on the top of this. 
symbolic of of what Jesus would accomplish as a satisfying offering to God. Now, I use the word satisfying. There's a fancier word in the Bible. It's called propitiation. But the word satisfying basically means that God's angry and something needs to satisfy his anger. Something needs to appease his anger. Now, why is God angry? Because we've sinned. What's going to calm him down? You know, I, now on a shallower illustration, you know, I can struggle with what's called hangry, right? Or, or hanger, right? When, when, when I'm hungry, I can be a little bit snippier, you know, but you know, if it's a Snickers bar, no, I don't like Snickers, but you know, if it's a, a good steak or, or, or one ton soup, right? Or just something like that, you know, that, that would just kind of satisfy. And then the, the hangry uh, chippiness would, would just go away, right? That's kind of a shallow illustration. But the idea here is that God is angry at sin. His wrath is directed towards mankind because of our evil against him. And so in order to propitiate God, in order to satisfy the wrath of God, Jesus gave himself as an offering. Now, this is the offering that was given, the sin offering that was given uh, during the Day of Atonement. But Jesus is that ultimate offering. That's why the New Testament even says, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means satisfaction. He is the satisfying offering to God where his blood would be sprinkled on this mercy seat so that we can have the mercy of God. Hebrews 9.12 says, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood and goats and calves, blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He did this on the eternal mercy seat. The third item we see, is the table for bread. Some people call this the table for show bread because it was, it was bread that was on display, reminding us that Jesus is our bread of life. Uh, it was com composed of this table, was composed of gold and wood. You see that there, there's little eyelets there so you can stick a pole uh, on both sides and it can be carried that way. It would be quite heavy overlaid with gold. It would contain 12 loaves of bread to uh, represent the 12 tribes of Israel. The fact that it was gold and wood represents the two natures of Christ, his deity and his humanity. The bread didn't have yeast. Yeastless bread is called unleavened, all right? Yeast is leaven, and yeast makes the bread rise. Sin rises quickly like yeast, and so Unleavened bread or unyeasted bread was a picture of sinlessness. And so he would be a picture of Jesus, the sinless bread of life, who cares for and loves uh, this nation of Israel. A beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in that. The next item we see is the golden lampstand. There was only one source of light inside, and it was this golden lampstand. It was gold that was pounded. It was beaten. And you can draw some allusion to the very fact that gold, Jesus is the pure king, and the fact that it was beaten, we could think of Isaiah 53 and, and, and what Jesus had to endure on our behalf. But here was the only source of light on the inside there. And Jesus is our only source of light. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus came to expel darkness and, uh, and he is our light. He is our bread. He is also our ultimate offering. There are instructions in chapter 27 of the bronze altar, again, made out of acacia, which is a very solid wood overlaid with brass, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet square, but it was four and a half feet high 
altar, the word altar means a high place. So the sacrifice had to be lifted up as Christ was lifted up on the cross, John 3, 14. It had to be an animal without blemish. It had to be uh, because the sacrifice had to not have blemishes as Jesus would be the sinless sacrifice. The priest would lay hands on it, a symbol of passing on the sins onto the animal, slaughter the animal. The blood would be, uh, the blood sprinkled on the horns and in front of the veil, and then the animal would be burnt on this altar. And so, you know, if you would think of the priest work, and I, I'm so grateful I'm a pastor and not an Old Testament priest, because we would spend a lot of our time doing butchering work. You know, you would be up high with your galoshes, or maybe not have galoshes, and then you just, you know, I mean, boy, your, your laundry bill would just be, uh, uh, and the stench, right, of, of, of the animals. That's constantly what they would do. Uh, and uh, and sacrificing animals. Now they would cook it on there, and and you know that's one large trigger or barbecue grill, you know. But uh, uh, but you know, and so it, there were. I'm sure that smelled pretty good, but that was tough. And doing what would be the burnt cereal piece sin and guilt offerings. I have, if you want to look at the notes, I describe those offerings. But uh, but they are all going to be ultimately represented by the ultimate offering of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, all of these all of these things in the tabernacle point to Christ. Hebrews 13, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is bought and brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sins are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endeared you know so here is just this this uh this recollection of what jesus did and and uh, what it means for us then we get a description in the 27th chapter of the tabernacle court in this tabernacle court uh, it was 150 by what was it 70 and then <coughs> 30 feet of it was the single gate on the east side. There is one access point to the tabernacle. And uh, and Jesus also describes himself as the door or as the gate. He is the only access. He is the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. Nobody enters into this tabernacle except through the one single gate. And Jesus, when he described himself as a gate, Israel knew exactly what he was talking about. Then he goes on to describe priests, and I wish I could talk a whole lot more about priests, uh, but ultimately Jesus is the ultimate high priest. Now, what do priests do? They offer sacrifices, but Jesus offered himself up as the substitute sacrifice for us. He replaced all of the animals. He replaced us dying for our own sin when he died on the cross. What else do priests do? They mediate between man and God. Jesus is the continuous mediator. There's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. What else do priests do? They pray for us. And it talks about Jesus as high priest ever lives to make intercession for us in Hebrews 7 and Romans 8. He's continually praying for us. So priests sacrifice. Jesus was a sacrifice. Priests mediate between man and God. He's the only mediator that we have. Uh, they pray. They pray. Jesus is uh, eternally praying for us. And then he's the role model for us. Because guess what? We're priests too in the New Testament. We're the chosen royal priesthood, according to 1 Peter 2.9. And he shows us how to be a priest. And so, so, uh, so this is the important role of a priest who were consecrated, even what they wore was very specific. Uh, it would be Aaron and, uh, and the Levites who would be specifically commissioned to be priests, but Jesus was the ultimate high priest. We get the altar of incense. This was uh, a, a unit that would burn incense and 
there was a beautiful fragrance that was lifted up before the Lord. Second Corinthians describes Jesus as a pleasing fragrance uh, before the Lord, uh, the fragrance of life, Second Corinthians talks about. And then we get the uh, we get a description. You know, we're all the way up to chapter thirty. We're going up to thirty one. Right, so we get the the bronze laver or a tub or a basin. This is where the um, the priest would wash himself, uh, and uh, uh, and on the day of atonement, the high priest would fully wash himself. When it wasn't the day of atonement, other priests would wash their hands and feet before entering the tabernacle here. But they would do this in this, this bronze tub or laver. Bronze was very reflective. So, you know, we would, uh, uh, there, there was a sense of self-reflection there. Water is cleansing and representative of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's also picturesque of Jesus washing the, the feet of the disciples. Because here, he's not just cleansing the hands and the feet, you know, that the priest would normally do. He's washing them whole like uh, the, the high priest had to do on the Day of Atonement. He, he's, he's uh, but, but here, and spiritually speaking, he's washing all of us. Then we get a specific recipe for the anointing oil. Uh, it, it would be olive oil that would be mixed with myrrh, cassia, cinnamon, and calamus. God was very specific about the ingredients, the amount, and its use. You couldn't use this recipe for something else because he said, this is holy oil. You can't replicate this recipe and use it for something else. Otherwise it'd be penalties, All right? So he was very specific about the oil and the incense. He also used gifted artists. What's amazing is the very first people who we see being full of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord, you know, it, it, it didn't, didn't just begin in the church. <laughs> with spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Excuse me, it happened back in Exodus with two artisans by the name of Bezalel and Ohaliab. He says, I filled them with the spirit of God with ability, with intelligence, with knowledge, all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze in cutting stone for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft. And then with Ohaliab, it says, I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. And so he gifted these artisans, gifted people to do the work. Why? So that it would be precise. Why? That it would be well done, that it would be excellent. Also, that it would be beautiful to reflect. I'm, I am so grateful you know, for, for John's talent of management and dealing with our architects and our contractors and, and the public and the politicians. I mean, it's just been so masterful to see uh, God at work through him. And then the various committees of people who have eyes for, for beauty and aesthetics. I don't. So I go to those meetings and I just keep my mouth shut because, you know, I, I'm not going to offer anything about color or design because I just don't know anything about that area. I'm so grateful for the gifted people who do. Uh, and God will use all of this and all of us to be used for his glory. He also talks about having the Sabbath observed, and uh, and that's in a, that was part of the important sign of God's covenant with, um, with, uh, with Moses. And so, so, so this is a, a, a little summary here of the, uh, the tabernacle. Why is this important? Because the tabernacle demonstrates God wants to be with us. He doesn't just say, all right, go do your thing. You're free. He says, no, I want to be with you in the midst of your community. And I want my presence to be with you. Right? That's why the tabernacle was important. God wants to be with us. Do you want to be with God? Or, or have you been resisting God and saying, you know what, I don't, I don't need him, or he's not important in my life. He wants to be with us. And when we realize that, you know, outside of the family that born us and made us, you know, and, uh, you know, some friends that, that love us, even those relationships can be strained. And to know that our creator 
wants to have an eternal relationship with us. That's one of the things that's pictured here in the tabernacle so that he can dwell with us. Secondly, it's a beautiful picture of how Christ planned to save us. You know, all this imagery where he is our staple bread. He is our ultimate sacrifice. He is our ultimate high priest who represents us before God. And all of these Old Testament pictures, it beautifully depicted who Jesus is when he came to be our savior. Will you trust Christ as your savior? And third, the fact that the tabernacle was central to the life of Israel, where we worshiped him together. Don't get too stale with the Zoom stuff and, and shelter in place where we forget the centrality of corporate worship with a church family. I can't wait for us to be together and looking at the tabernacle only makes me long for that more. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the way that you've depicted our Savior in the tabernacle. Thank you for how you also depicted what was necessary for salvation in the sacrifices, in the incense, in the, uh, the, the oil, the, the anointing oil, the work of the priests, and how all of this is pointing to Jesus, our Savior. Father, thank you for wanting to be with us and wanting to save us from our sin, from Old Testament times to New Testament times to today. Father, thank you for that great love that this displays towards us and the beauty of the picture of Christ through this tabernacle. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let me call your attention to a few announcements. Um, if you want to type your prayer requests or praises into the chat block box, please do so. And we will process it and, and lead us uh, at the end of our announcements here. Um, we step by step starts a little bit earlier today. They start at 12 noon men's prayer. Uh, that is in lieu of our business meeting that is going uh, that's scheduled later. <laughs> Our Give Me Jesus series does continue um, 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, we're going to leave a little bit early today just to get to the business meeting. And so um, uh, our kids series is still going on, though. Our uh, CBM camp starts today. Um, I apologize. The date says the 19th, but it is the 18th tonight. A virtual middle school and high school camp. If you want to get uh, if you want to join this evening, you still can do so. And so, um, you know, just go to the uh, website and link and just sign up and uh, join them this evening. Uh, we want to pray. Uh, um, Jordan and Ryan are um, some of our directors for our uh, virtual middle school and high school camp. And so we want to pray for all those who are attending uh, that this will be a blessing to them. And then the week after live camp starts, uh, we want to pray for Brad and Bert, who are our uh, director and registrar, as well as some other folks. But we have over 200 kids meeting in person um, for that date. But you can sign up for e – well, it's it's pretty full already. You, you could try, but um, I think uh, it is pretty hard to go to live camp already. But join join virtual camp if you can't go to live camp. But that, this is the website. You can join and sign up. Um, we are projecting to have a picnic. Uh, um, whether we might be in the church already, we might not be in the church uh, yet, but we probably will be. But And we're trying to figure out all the logistics, but we have reserved the park, Booth Bay Park in Foster City Sunday, not a Saturday, but a Sunday uh, September 19th. Details will be forthcoming, but we're excited that there's a picnic uh, that's planned for us. Uh, church a business meeting is today on FBC Zoom 1, same uh, link as we are right presently. And some join us for important business, uh, a financial update, um, building update, um, a missions update. Um, we'll pray together. And so um, come uh, everyone is welcome to come join us at our business meeting. Our scholarship fund continues uh, gather funds uh, throughout this this month. And so if you want to send a check 
uh, in support of those preparing for church uh, full-time Christian ministry. Um, you can do so, just earmark the check, send it to FBC, or you can contact Eric, our, our deacon in charge. Um, FBC watch sale continues through the end of this month. We only have a few weeks left. I know a few um, folks have purchased uh, some of these beautiful watches. And uh, these are some examples, mostly Swiss, some European watches available, uh, beautiful, great. And, uh, you know, check, so check out the, the website. Uh, it, is, um, it is affordable. And all proceeds go to FBC Building Fund. Welcome committee and ushers are looking for help uh, in preparation for reopening. And so our welcome committee, uh, Benny Poon or Barry, uh, Ken or Will Wu, uh, uh, if you uh, want to join our usher group, a group and they're reorganized and getting things ready just to make sure that all our visitors are well taken care of. And so be part of that. We, we, would, uh, we would appreciate that. Online giving continues on the website. And our missionary of the week is Alberto and Paloma Perez. They are uh, church planning in Sacramento. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the challenges of, of uh, running a church um, is that is what they're experiencing, especially during this COVID time. So we want to pray for, for them. So let's, um, let's bow, bow and pray together. Father, thank you for, um, we thank you, Lord, for our message today. Thank you, Lord, for um, um, just the Lord uh, giving details of a central place for worship, uh, like the tabernacle. And Lord, we have a local centralized place for worship that we've been uh, working on. And uh, we're excited, Lord, that, that this can be a focus of our worship and growing uh, activities, spiritual growth activities, outreach, uh, that people can come here to uh, just grow closer to you. And so, um, Lord, continue the work of uh, the building and the, that ministry. And we pray that we can meet together soon again. Um, we do want to pray for our missionaries, Alberto and Paloma Perez. Thank you for their ministry to build up uh, the Hispanic church over in the Sacramento area. Thank you, Lord, for um, a, a very difficult ministry, especially during COVID as well. But we thank you for them continually re reaching out to their community. We pray that you'll keep them safe. You also uh, help uh, hearts to be even more open to the gospel message during the pandemic and all that uh, all that has gone on. And so, uh, Lord, meet all their needs, help guide them into uh, growing the church out there, the church, uh, um, your church, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for our time of prayer, and we look forward to uh, our business meeting a little later. Uh, bless the rest of our day in Christ's name. Amen.